Okay, uh, it's time to start. I, I forget to open the video and amuse myself. Okay, uh, uh, dear uh, colleagues and uh, audience, and uh, welcome to attend the Professor Will Six uh, Will Three Six uh, lecture on logic and the foundations of mathematics at the Wuhan University. Uh, I'm Chen Yong from a uh, uh, School of Philosophy at the Wuhan University. Okay, uh, January fourteen is the World Logic Day. On twenty sixth November twenty nineteen, the first general conference of uh, UNESCO, uh, proclaimed the fourteenth January to be World Logical Day. Fourteen January is the date of death of Kurt Gödel and the death of birth of Alfred Tarski, two of the most uh, prominent logicians of the twentieth century. Uh, it's, my, it's our pleasure to introduce the, the speaker today. Professor Wilfried Sick is the Patrick Supis, Professor of Logic and Philosophy at the Carnegie Mellon University and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science. He received his PhD from Stanford University in 1977. From 1977 to 1985, he was assistant and associate professor at the Columbia University. He joined the Carnegie Mellon faculty in 1985 as a founding member of the university's philosophy department and served as his head from 1994 to 2005. He is internationally known for mathematical work in proof theory, historical work, and the emergence of modern mathematics and the logic analysis of the concept of computability and the, philosoph and the uh, philosophical essays on the nature of mathematics. Over the last three decades, he has also developed novel methods for human-centered automated proof search. This method has been implemented into web-based courses to support the individual learning of proof construction in logic and the elementary set theory. Uh, he has many publications, uh, especially he is the author or uh, uh, editor of the following book. For example, Herbert's Program and the Beyond, Fifferman on Foundations, Logic and Mathematics, uh, Mathematics and the Philosophy, Reflections on the Foundations of Mathematics, Essays in honor of Solomon Feferman, acting and reflecting the interdisciplinary term in philosophy. Uh, okay, uh, today, uh, Professor Wilfred Sieg will uh, talk about, about uh, 90 minutes. Uh, uh, since this is uh, a lecture for general audience, so we did not uh, seek the formal role of the interlocutor, and uh, all audience are very welcome to ask questions if you have, and uh, you can uh, write down your question in the chat box, and the staff in the Xue Shu Zhi will forward your question to us, and then Professor Wilfried Sieg will give his replies. Okay, now uh, let's welcome Professor Wilfried Sieg give his lecture, uh, Methodological Friends, Mathematical Structure Reason, and the Proof Theorem. Okay, please. Thank you so much. It is really a great pleasure and a wonderful opportunity to be here in Wuhan, even if only virtually. So I wanted to thank you, Professor Yong Cheng, for inviting me to present a paper to all of you. That paper, as you saw, already has the title Methodological Frames, Mathematical Structuralism, and Proof Theory. And let me share my screen now. Yes, yeah, so today is World Logic Day. And if you look at UNESCO's declaration of January 14th as the World Logic Day, you can read the following. The ability to think is one of the most defining features of humankind. 
According to the classic Western tradition, human beings are defined as rational or logical animals. Logic, as the investigation on the principles of reasoning, has been studied by many civilizations throughout history, and since its earliest formulations, logic has played an important role in the development of philosophy and also the sciences. This is followed by the programmatic point of the celebration. The proclamation of World Logic Day intends to bring the intellectual history, conceptual significance, and practical implications of logic to the attention of interdisciplinary science communities and the broader public. Expanding on this programmatically significant point, the declaration continues. Furthermore, the celebration of World Logic Day can also contribute to the promotion of a culture of peace, dialogue, and mutual understanding based on the advancement of education and science. It would clearly be preposterous for me to think that my talk would contribute to all these programmatic points. Instead, I will focus on the intellectual history, conceptual significance, and practical implications of logic. The first two points will be viewed in the restricted context of foundation investigations for mathematics beginning in the late 19th century. As to practical implications, I will discuss the closely connected advancement in education. However, even within this restricted context of my talk, I will analyze only a particular strand that was woven by one of the outstanding mathematicians in the first half of the 20th century, David Hilbert, and his close collaborator, Paul Bernays. They initiated proof theory as a branch of mathematical logic. Proof theory was to provide the framework for the investigation of the concept of the specifically mathematical proof. But it also served as the primary tool for mediating between objectually concrete and conceptually abstract tendencies in mathematics. In the contemporary foundational discussion, it is concerned with the tension between constructive and classical mathematics. The mediation between these, two, between these positions was to be achieved by the finitist consistency program that was formulated in 1922. And as you know, this radical program was refuted by Gödel's incompleteness theorems that were discovered in 1930 and published in 1931. But before I do anything else, I wanted to make one remark. The terminology I used in the descriptive account I just gave is standard, but it is really quite misleading. After all, it is not classical mathematics that was to be justified on the basis of some philosophically inspired novel finitist standpoint, but it is rather modern structural mathematics that was to be justified on the basis of classical constructive mathematics, as it was expressed already in Kronecker. So, but that's a remark of a very general character. Uh, let me proceed with the context and overview. In his 1930 paper, Die Philosophie der Mathematik und die Hilbertsche Beweistheorie, 
Bernays viewed mathematics as the science of idealized structures. His perspective highlights the methodological changes that he expanded, indeed transformed the subject during the second half of the 19th century. He pointed to three related features characterizing this transformation. Number one, the advancement of the concept of set. Number two, the emergence of structural axiomatics. And number three, the evolution of a close connection between logic and mathematics. He saw these developments as confronting the philosophy of mathematics with novel insights, but also new problems. Bernays took on the task of situating proof theory within the philosophy of mathematics, and in particular of clarifying the character of mathematical cognition. I should emphasize that Bernays' paper, published in 1930, barely preceded the discovery of Gödel's incompleteness theorems that refuted the finitist program. And so let me outline my discussion of the pre- and post gödel approaches to the basic issues. And here is the rough overview of what I want to talk about. So, to come back to this 19th century transformation, well, it revealed structural axiomatics. It is the origin of mathematical structuralism that evolved from Dedekind's work and is fully expressed in Bourbaki's Elements de Mathematique. That is the topic of section two, mathematical structuralism. In Dedekind, we find the exhortation to prove everything that can be proved and prove abstractly without appeal to intuition. However, neither in Dedekind's nor in Hilbert's early work is there a precise concept of a mathematical proof. Only in 1917 did Hilbert explore in detail the system of Principia Mathematica as a means of formalizing elementary number theory and analysis. It was the elementary constructive description of a formalism they give, that is, Hilbert and Bernays gave in lectures 1917-1918, that prompted the idea of a new kind of consistency proof. Section three discusses that transition under the title formalization and reduction. Gödel's theorems, as I pointed out already, refuted a narrow finitist program. Extensions of the constructivist basis are discussed in section four under the title Accessible Objects and Principles. Finally, we return to the task Bernays took on in 1930, clarifying the character of mathematical cognition. That is done in section five under the heading Proofs as Objects. And I discussed it already prior to today's lecture with Professor Chang, uh, namely that I would present the first three parts as the main part of my lecture, then uh, have questions from you. And then after that part has been discussed and uh, properly uh, presented, uh, I go to the last part, proofs as objects because there is a, a complementary character to these overall big parts. 
two to four and five. In any event, let me begin then with number two, mathematical structuralism. This is strange. And there is a form of axiomatization in modern mathematics that is not tied to theories of mathematical logic with their formal languages and logical calculi. I'm thinking of the axioms for abstract concepts like that of a group, field, or topological space. The axioms are just characteristics or characteristic conditions of structural definitions. Such definitions stand in a venerable tradition that goes back to Dedekind's work in algebraic number theory, but also to his essay, Was sind und was sollen die Zahlen? In that 1888 essay, Dedekind discards natural numbers as abstract objects and introduces instead the concept of a simply infinite system via such a structural definition. And here it is. He calls a system of any kinds of objects, n, simply infinite, if and only if there is a mapping from n to n and an element a in n such that the image of n is a subset of n. n is the chain of the system consisting of just the element A with respect to F. I explain what that is. A is not an element of the image of N, and F, this mapping, is, as Dedekind calls it, similar, we would call it injective. What is the chain of the system A? It is the intersection of all sets, systems, that contain the element A and are closed under the function f. It's the typical way of making an an inductive definition explicit. So, so in a certain sense, then, n is the minimal such a set that is containing a and closed under f. And I just wanted to point out the very special way in which this is done. This is literally, well, in English, I'm not in German, the definition Dedekind gives with the existential quantifiers in place. And I think that's important to, to notice. Uh, it, it is a kind of abstraction that was introduced into logic by a philosopher namely Hermann Lotze. And Lotze had a significant influence on Dedekind and also on Frege. But be that as it may, let me mention two other examples of structural definitions in the Dedekindian mode. There is Hilbert's axiomatization in Grundlagen der Geometrie of the concept Euclidean space. And he gives the definition of Euclidean space in exactly this way. The second additional example is Zermelo's 1908 axiom system for set theory. It gives a structural definition in this way of the concept Mengenbereich, domain of sets of the set of Uber elements. So here are three examples of structural definitions, axiomatizations, as we would call them, in a different way. Namely, you give a structural definition, abstract, whatever, and um, then possibly investigate matters. 
The axiomatic method, when conceived of as structural, requires an intelligible and philosophically distinguished methodological frame, what Bernays calls methodischer Rahmen. And I just try to translate it as methodological frame. For Dedekind, that methodological frame was logic, broadly understood, including the uh, doctrine of how one gives definitions, how notions are introduced, uh, and lots of epistemological questions as well. It is not formal logic. And the same holds for the early Hilbert and Samilo. They saw themselves as working within this broad concept of logic. And this logical frame allowed novel metamathematical kinds of investigations in a precise way. The central ones, metamathematical investigations, could be carried out due to the fact that a form of semantics was available. Model is any system that falls under a given structural concept or that satisfies its characteristic conditions. I mean, if you, in a mathematics course, give examples of groups, what do you do? You have the abstract notion of a group, and then you show that this particular mathematical object, system of objects, plus uh, function, the composition of group elements, uh, inversion, whatever, satisfies those axioms. You don't give a truth definition. So that's perfectly, perfectly precise and perfectly sensible. So you have a concept of model, and Dedekind had introduced in his was in Zahlen and also in other mathematical uh, papers and works the notion of a mapping. And mappings were a second kind of mathematical entity that complemented the other central concept, namely the concept of a system, or as you would say, set. Because he had this general concept of mapping, he was able to relate different models in structure-preserving ways. And within this frame, Dedekind proved that the concept of a simply infinite system is categorical and argued for the proof theoretic equivalence of any two models. The methodological frame was not only significant for metamathematical investigations, but also, uh, well, perhaps uh, I should go back to the previous slide and leave the sitting there and just emphasize that Hilbert was an absolute master in using models to give independence and relative consistency proofs. His investigations show in the most striking way the irrelevance of the, quote, nature of the objects making up a system that falls under the structural definitions. He gave, after all, an analytic model of Euclidean geometry, and he gave a geometric model of the concept Archimedean ordered field uh, in Grundlagende Geometry. So this point that the nature of the objects is irrelevant is made in a very striking and direct way. So the methodological frame was not only significant for metamathematical investigations, but also for the representation of mathematical practice. In WZ, that's was in Zahlen, Dedekind's essay from 1888, the representation of elementary number three was at stake and was achieved through the justification of both 
the principle of proof by induction, and the principle of definition by recursion. I should emphasize that the development of Dedekind's theory of systems and of mappings is principal. I mean, you have to draw them out, those principles, but they are there. The part concerning systems uses full comprehension and the extensionality principle. Full comprehension, extensionality. Whereas the part concerning mapping uses, for example, closure under composition and inversion for projections, and he has a list of functions that are directly shown, uh, of objects that are directly shown to be mappings. For example, the identity. Zermelo's system Z that was introduced in 1908 can be understood as a reconceptualization of Dedekind's logical frame. The contradictory full comprehension principle is replaced by the separation principle, and the latter is supplemented by a set existence principles. For example, the power set axiom, the union axiom, the axiom in his case, guaranteeing the empty set, uh, the singleton of the set, and so forth, and the axiom of infinity. There is, however, one notable change. Mappings are no longer considered as belonging to a separate category of mathematical entities. They are defined as sets. During the next 20 years, Zermelo system Z was developed into ZF, Zermelo Frankel set theory. Here's Zermelo's path-breaking 1930 paper über Grenzzahlen und Mengenbereiche on boundary numbers and domains of sets, did for the concept of Mengenbereich, domain of set, what Dedekind had done for the concept simply infinite system. Namely, he established the quasi-categoricity of that concept. As you know, it's done for initial segments of the cumulative hierarchy. That's why quasi-categoricity. This system ZF was adopted by mathematicians as the framework in the 20s as the framework for structural axiomatics. This way of looking at mathematics from a conceptual point of view was clearly articulated by Bogaki. In their programmatic paper, The Architecture of Mathematics, it was published in 1950, the role of principal structures is brought out. They also clarify what is to be understood in general by a mathematical structure. And here's a quote. The common character of the different concepts designated by this generic name, mathematical structure, is that they can be applied to sets of elements whose nature has not been specified. To define a structure, one takes as given one or several relations into which these elements enter. And then Bobaki gives an example of group theory. Then one postulates that the given relation or relations satisfy certain conditions, which are explicitly stated and which are the axioms of the structure under consideration. That is a description of what Dedekind, Hilbert, and Samuelo did in their axiomatization.
For Bobaki, the expression, this system of mathematical objects has the structure of blah, 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 put in any uh, mathematical concept like group, field, topological space in it, is synonymous with the system of mathematical objects falls under the concept of blah, 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 group, field, topological space. Bobaki concludes this passage on structures in general as follows. To set up the axiomatic theory of a given structure amounts to the deduction of the logical consequences of the axioms of the structure, excluding every other hypothesis on the elements under consideration. In particular, every hypothesis as to their own nature. That's exactly what Dedekind emphasized and required for proofs in dimensional theory. Not to use anything but the characteristic features that are articulated in the notion of a simply infinite system, and then proceed in a cordological way. So I think the parallelism to what Dedekind had done, what Hilbert and Samilo did, is direct and striking. Indeed, there are both the key papers prior to the programmatic 1950 paper that show the group to be in the structuralist tradition of Dedekind and Hilbert and other mathematicians of the 1920s, Emil Hütte, uh, Emil Artin. But they refuse to take on their consistency charge. But that's a different, different matter. Before describing, however, this consistency challenge in the next section, I let Hilbert speak about his conception of mathematics in the early part of his second foundationally focused period. In a lecture, Hilbert gave in 1919, it's called Natur Mathematisches Erkennen, nature, nature and Mathematical Cognition. Hilbert wanted to support the claim that, and I quote, the formation of concepts in mathematics is constantly guided by intuition and experience, so that on the whole, mathematics is a non arbitrary unified structure, end quote. And he formulated his general point in the following striking way. And I quote again. The different mathematical disciplines are necessary parts in the construction of a systematic development of thought. This development begins with simple natural questions and proceeds on a path that is essentially traced out by compelling internal reasons. There is no question of arbitrariness. Mathematics is not like a game that determines the task by arbitrary invented rules, but rather a conceptual system of internal necessity that can only be thus and not otherwise." End quote. I quoted this passage to make it crystal clear that the formalization of parts of mathematics Hilbert had carried out would become a tool for him. However, it took a while before features of the tool would inspire proof theory and would be used in the pursuit of reductions. And that leads me to the second part of the main part of my lecture, formalization and reduction. So I talked about the consistency challenge. 
And as a matter of fact, Dirkind had articulated that challenge already in his 1888 essay, and also quite explicitly uh, in a letter he had sent to a German colleague, Hans Kieferstein, in 1890. He demanded that his foundational frame, that is logic broadly conceived, give a logical existence proof of a model of the concept simply infinite system. And you all know how problematic his own proof of such uh, a model turned out to be. But be that as it may, that's a different issue we can discuss. He asserted that such a proof was needed to guarantee that the newly introduced concept of a simply infinite system did not contain an internal contradiction. Herbert formulated this demand from the very beginning of his axiomatic investigations in a different way, namely in a quasi-syntactic way, requiring that no contradiction can be obtained in finitely many logical steps. And I call this only quasi-syntactic, as no logical steps were explicitly presented. There was no rigorous concept of logical proof. No. Again, I should leave this and make a couple of other remarks because that's important for the overall story. All the proof ideas for the consistency of what Hilbert called arithmetic around 1900, but we would call analysis, that, is in, that I indicated in lectures and publications from this early period around 1900, are of a semantic kind, that is of a kind that had been used by Dedekind. In 1913, the group around Hilbert started a systematic study of Principia Mathematica that ultimately resulted in lectures Hilbert gave in 1917-1918. Principia de Mathematica. Those lectures were written up by Bernays and are a marvelous document in the history of logic. In them, you find the exquisite beginning of our subject, mathematical logic. That new subject does not only view logic as a foundation of mathematics, but gave a precise mathematical formulation of the total formalism and turned it into an object of mathematical investigation. So, poor questions were raised above and beyond consistency issues. They came in later in a different way. Semantic completeness of calculi. That was actually proved by Bernays in his application in 1918. And then, of course, by Gürtel for first order logic. And second core problem, the decision problem that was promoted by Hilbert in lectures later on also and resolved by Church and Turing. In any event, so that's the beginning of mathematical logic. It is not the textbook by Hilbert and Ackermann that was published in 1928 that is the beginning of mathematical logic, but it are these early lectures that are essentially constituting about 90% of the text of Hilbert and Ackermann. But that's a different. Is what I wanted to say, yes. Uh, excuse me, 
Okay. Okay, that's okay. It seems like your slide is not advancing. So, uh, because you are talking about the past three, but uh, anyway, you, uh, you just keep your slide to be advancing. Yeah. Did it, did it advance this time? I mean, some parts I don't have slides for. Oh, okay, okay just you can just go talk. Ahead. So, uh, not, not everything is on my slides. Not everything I'm saying is on my slides. Uh, in any event, so, so in those 1970, 1918 lectures, Hilbert and Berner has transformed a part of the system of Principia Mathematica with the axiom of reducibility into a tool for formalizing analysis. They, of course, don't do all of analysis, but just parts of the deep principles. Having completed their proof of the least upper bound principle in this system, their final comment was this. And this is literally the last sentence of those lectures. Thus, it is clear that the introduction of the axiom of reducibility is the appropriate means to turn the ramified calculus into a system out of which the foundations of higher mathematics can be developed. And here is the core methodological question they wanted to answer. Does this system provide a logicist foundation for mathematics? If it did, If you look at the talk Hilbert gave before he gave these lectures in Göttingen, Hilbert had reiterated Dedekind's view that mathematics is a part of logic. The fundamental work of Frege and Russell bolstered that view, and Hilbert remarked, but since the examination of consistency is a task that cannot be avoided, it appears necessary to axiomatize logic itself and prove that number theory and set theory are only parts of logic. And logic was conceived at this point as the system of Principia Mathematica. That was supposed to be logic. This method was prepared long ago, not least by Frege's profound investigations. It has been most successfully explained by the acute mathematician and logician, Russell. One could regard the completion of this magnificent Russellian enterprise of the axiomatization of logic as the crowning achievement of the work of axiomatization as a whole. At this meeting, and no slide for that, Hilbert asked Bernays to become his assistant for the foundations of mathematics. Bernays accepted the offer and returned to his alma mater in the following winter, winter term. From the beginning, the two had a productive collaboration that led to an immediate and significant outcome, namely the 1917-1918 lectures I just discussed. Having ended the lectures with the remark concerning the formalization of analysis, the central methodological question was, and I indicated that already, is the frame of Principia Mathematica still logic? 
Ihr werdet Bermes analyzed von CP Mathematik in subsequent lectures and examined, in particular, the nature of the axiom of reducibility. Incidentally, just as a side remark, these lectures in which they analyzed Principia Mathematica and the axiom of reducibility is the most fascinating and uh, incisive analysis of the Russell Whited system before uh, Gurdjieff's analysis. But that's a side remark. They concluded that its acceptance, the acceptance of the axiom of reducibility, amounted to using structural axiomatics in a different guise. Thus, Russell's approach did not resolve the foundational problem. Mathematics could not be reduced to logic. Bernays articulated in 1921 the issue of assuming the existence of a model for any structural notion as follows. And thus, if one would do this, have a consistency proof in the way in which Lady Kent given it, a semantic one. He says, in the assumption of such a system with particular structural properties lies something, so to speak, transcendental for mathematics. And the question arises, which principled position with respect to it should be taken? And as a matter of fact, he asserts that an intuitive grasp of the completed sequence of natural numbers, or even of the manifold of real numbers, should not be excluded out of it. But alluding to the contemporaneous tendencies in the exact sciences, in the exact sciences he suggested a different strategy, namely to see whether it is not possible to give a foundation of these transcendental assumptions in such a way that only primitive intuitive knowledge is being used. Bernays' programmatic suggestion is brought to life through the idea of projecting structural definitions into a constructive domain and examining the image from a constructivist standpoint. The formalization of the structural notion was seen as the means of projecting. In his 1930 essay, that I mentioned early on, he expresses matters in a different way that articulates why it is that formalization of the structural notion can be taken as this means of projecting because there's an underlying uh, articulation that is, that is quite striking and important. He says, at this point, the investigation of mathematical proofs by means of the logical calculus is brought to bear in a decisive way. This investigation, that is formalizing parts of mathematics, has shown that the concept formations and the inference patterns used in the theories of analysis and set theory are reducible to a limited number of processes and rules. In that way, we succeed in totally formalizing these theories within the frame of a precisely delimited symbolism. Note 
that the total formalization with restricted processes and rules is at stake, not the syntactic completeness of the formal theory used to capture the structural concept. At this point, normative considerations as to the effectiveness of formal theories entered. After all, it should be decidable by a finite procedure whether a given syntactic configuration constitutes the form proof or not. The effective formalizability underlies Hilbert's view that the consistency problem for formal theories is a constructive one. I brought into the discussion this image of projection. And that is as much of the permanent feature of Berna's thinking about the programmatic finitist and later broader constructivist frameworks. He had introduced this idea, the image of projection, in the early 1920s. But as late as 1970, well, it's very close to the end of his life, he wrote, taking the deductive structure of a formalized theory as an object of investigation, the structural axiomatic theory is projected, as it were, into the number theoretic domain. That was a quote. The projection has an important point. And I quote again, the number theory structure can serve to recognize the consistency of the theory from a standpoint that is more elementary than the assumption of the intended structure. End of quote. The emphasis on number theoretic structures is an artifact of the developments in the wake of Gödel's 1931 paper, namely the arithmetization of mathematics. Initially, in the early 20s, Hilbert and Berners viewed the exclusive focus on natural numbers as, as they said, methodological prejudice. In their proof theoretic studies during the 1920s, they operated with what they thought of as broader classes of mathematical objects, namely finite syntactic configurations like formulae and derivations, and accepted without any question induction and recursion principles for these classes of uh, syntactic objects. The methodological situation I described is diagrammatically depicted in a figure I'll show you in a minute, making clear the reductive rule of the projection. It avoids models and their representation. It rather creates an image in the finitist domain, and that image is to be investigated from the finitist standpoint. And here is the diagram. Structural axiomatics formalized and projective into the finitist domain. And then you have these syntactic configurations that are investigated in the framework of finitist mathematics. As you also know, finitist mathematics was never described in a precise way by Hilbert and Bernays. It is open ended. Uh, with some limitations. But uh, they certainly viewed it in a broad way that is not restrictive uh, in a dramatic way. In the 1920s, up to the early 1930s, in Göttingen it was believed that finitist mathematics is coextensional with intuitionist mathematics. For Neumann, Abraham, Bernays, they used 
Finitist and intuitionist synonymously. Berner has described intuitionist mathematics as finitist mathematics with a particular or peculiar philosophical perspective. In any that is again a side remark. But, but you know, I think uh, it is directed towards the exclusive focus of the uh, foundational discussion in the 1920s as the Grundlagenstreit between Brauer and Hilbert. I mean, if you view this, if you can see quite clearly the intuitionist mathematics as a constructive framework, was supposed to be coextension with finitist mathematics. What is the dispute about the foundations about? But uh, let's look back at this uh, marvelous diagram and consider as an exemplification uh, of this methodological schema the structural concept of complete ordered field, that is, an axiom system for the reals, as formalized in second order number theory. In the finitist domain, one has to represent only the elementary formalism, not the infinite objects of its models. So, Hilbert and Berners proved in 1922 the consistency of what we would now call primitive recursive arithmetic. And Hilbert gave, by the introduction of his epsilon calculus, a tool by means of which quantifiers could be dealt with. And Ackermann, in his thesis, used this tool, expanding the investigations of Hilbert and Berners from 1922, and presumably had proof the consistency not only of arithmetic, but of analysis. Well, it turned out to be wrong. But in any event, the point was that there was a consistency proof given by Hilbert and Berners in 1922, extended by uh, Ackermann, and also von Neumann did work on proof theory in the 1920s. And in his address of 1928 to the International Congress of Mathematicians of Mathematics in Bologna, Hilbert gave a very beautiful description of the then current status of foundation investigations. In particular, he pointed out that von Neumann and Ackermann had proved the consistency of arithmetic, of full beyond arithmetic, which of course turned out to be wrong, and that Ackermann was on the verge of proving the consistency of analysis. There was just one finiteness theorem that had to be proved. Now, all of this very optimistic perspective on the prospects of proof theory were, of course, shattered by the incompleteness theorems. And so then the question is what to do? What can be done? Should one simply say, okay, Hilbert's problem has been refuted, Feynman's problem is gone, nothing can be done in proof theory anymore? Well, people started to think about extensions of the finitist project. And the first part in this attempt of doing something beyond a restricted form of finitism of constructive mathematics was a recognition that finitist and intuitionist mathematics did not coincide, were not coextension. But let me move on from 1931 to 1938. 
Hilbert, no, Gödel, gave a lecture at a seminar that was run by uh, a Viennese colleague called Zilze. Um, and in this lecture, Gödel noted that Hilbert's finitist program had been attractive to mathematicians, but also to philosophers. He wrote, if the original Hilbert program could have been carried out, that would have been without any doubt an enormous epistemological of enormous epistemological value. The following requirements would both have been satisfied. A. Mathematics would have been reduced to a very small part of itself. And B. Everything would really have been reduced to a concrete basis on which everyone must be able to agree. Gödel explored in this lecture a variety of extensions of finitist mathematics, from transfinite induction used in Gensen's proof of the consistency of arithmetic to his own system of computable functions of finite type that led eventually to the dialectical interpretation. In the very same year, 1938, Bernays addressed the same question Gödel had asked at Silicis. How can one extend the finitist standpoint? He did this in a paper delivered in 1938 at the Arthur de Zürich. He, Bernays, also examined Gensen's consistency proof via transfinite induction and asserted, like Gödel, that this principle went beyond finitist mathematics. Gödel referred to the French 1941 publication of this paper in a letter to Bernays of January 16, 1942. He writes, he, Gödel, with obvious surprise, I read your article in the Entretien de Zürich from the year 1938 with great interest. Only what you say on page 152, lines 8 to 11, is not comprehensible to me. Wouldn't that be tantamount to giving up the formalist standpoint? Gödel pointed to the last sentence of a paragraph in which Bernays answered a question he had posed to himself. Namely, and this is on Bernays, what is the methodological restriction of proof theory if it is not the restriction of the elementary evidence of the finitist standpoint? Bernays wrote then and there, one can respond to this question that the general nature of the methodologic restriction remains in principle exactly the same. However, if we want to keep open the possibility of extending the methodological frame, then we must avoid using these the concepts of evidence and certainty in a sense that is not too absolute. Having articulated in this way an open perspective that allows distinguishing between different layers and kinds of evidence, Bernays insists on the methodological significance of syntactic consistency proofs. And writes, now in the letter to Gödel, the task of establishing the inner harmony of analysis from such a standpoint of more elementary evidence as a syntactic necessity by formalizing the inferences of analysis, that task gains in this way its methodological significance. So that is the perspective on the role of formalization and it plays in reducing 
structural concepts to constructive objects that can be dealt with in the proper constructive theory. In the next section of my talk, I will try to articulate the general nature of the methodological restriction. Accessible objects and principles. So the question is, what standpoint of more elementary evidence can be taken? In subsequent papers, Bern has made some general suggestions. Which point in a direction that can be given more weight and significance by exploiting our more extended experience with proof theoretic investigations? To indicate the core metamathematical and methodological issues, I'm going to mention three examples of proof theoretic work. But let me first recall again the context in which that proof theoretic work makes sense. Structural definitions, structural axiomatic theories are to be projected via their associated formal development into a constructive domain. Their images are to be investigated from a constructive standpoint with the goal of establishing their consistency. Berner has highlighted these constructivity features in a paper he published in 1954 as the metamathematical investigations must be embedded for Bernas in a suitable methodological frame. And to be suitable for the reductive aims, Bernas requires that methodological frames must satisfy, must satisfy these constructivity requirements. In particular, a crucial condition on mathematical objects in constructive domains. He says, the objects making up the intended model of the theory, the constructive theory, are not taken from the domain as being already given, but are rather constituted by generative processes. That is, they are supposed to be inductively generated. The nature of the objects is as irrelevant for Bernas as it was for Dedekind. But the generative processes give them a unique internal structure that is independent of the totality of all generated objects. The first proof theoretic study of the three I want to mention changed the general approach to the consistency problem. And I alluded to this already earlier. Gödel and Gensen independently established in 1932 the consistency of full elementary number theory, piano arithmetic, relative to its intuitionist variant, Heiting arithmetic. The result showed that intuitionist mathematics is a proper constructive extension of finitist mathematics. And Bernays wrote in a contribution to the Encyclopedia of Philosophy that this result made exactly this point, namely separating finitism from intuitionism and seeing intuitionist mathematics as an extension of finitist mathematics. So, as the first result, we have piano arithmetic being reducible to Heiting arithmetic. And one can view this result as having been obtained by a projection of the concept simply infinite system 
through its formalization in piano arithmetic into a subdomain of intuitionist mathematics. And the connections are indicated in a modification of the first diagram I showed you. Namely, we have a particular structural axiomatic theory, that of a simply infinite system, that is partially formalized in piano arithmetic, and that formalization pushes, projects the simply infinite, the theory of the simply infinite system into the subdomain of intuitionist mathematics. And its consistency can be established in Heiting arithmetic. So, what is the difference? Well, we have a particular structural axiomatic system, simply infinite system. We have an articulation now of the constructive principles that are being used in the consistency proof. The second study involving a system indicated by ACA naught um, uses a subsystem of analysis, second order number theory, with the comprehension principle restricted to arithmetic formulae. The system is called theory of arithmetic property and is denoted as SCA naught in the program of reverse mathematics of Friedman and Simpson. Um, it can be shown to be conservative over piano arithmetic. That is, piano arithmetic is relative consistent to Heiting arithmetic. ACA naught is consistent relative to Heiting arithmetic. So the theory of arithmetic properties is reducible to Heiting arithmetic. And so if you look back at the diagram, replace simply infinite system by the theory of arithmetic property um, analysis, second order number theory, formalization partial in ACA naught, formalization in Heiting arithmetic, the projection goes into the subdomain of intuitionist mathematics. And the third study aims also for a projection of the notion of a complete audit field or analysis. Um, but this time it is formalized in a much, much stronger theory. Uh, that involves impredicative comprehension. The reductive result is articulated in this way, namely that the theory of pi one one comprehension can be reduced to the intuitionist theory of finite constructive number classes. Pi one one CA naught is as ACA naught, except that the comprehension principle is now articulated for pi one one formula. And the constructive, this theory ID uh, less than omega of O is an extension of Heiting arithmetic by closure and induction principles for the finite number classes and perfectly acceptable from an interest perspective. Uh, here I should, should mention two facts, namely that in ACA naught, many people say that it is a sufficient formal framework for carrying out Hermann Weil's 
Mathematical Consideration in Das Continuum from 1918. And in Pi 11 c I note, one can directly formalize all the very beautiful considerations, mathematical considerations of Hilbert Bermas in a supplement to the second volume of Grundlagen der Mathematik. There they develop mathematical analysis in full second order number theory. But if you pay attention to what they actually use, pi 11 c a is sufficient. So these two th theories, a c a naught and pi 11 c a, have interesting uh, uh, features uh, that make them important for mathematical practice. So let me uh, give a summary of the discussion of these investigations with the help of the diagrams. The first diagram indicated the perspective of finitist investigations of the images of structural axiomatic things. The images have been obtained via the formalization of the theories. The second diagram adds two significant new components. The image of the projected abstract motion is no longer found in the finitist domain, but rather in that of intuitionist mathematics. That is the first new component. The second new component is the formal articulation of the theory in which the metamathematic investigations proceed, namely Heidegger arithmetic and this theory, ID of the finite number classes. So those are three examples of projections of structural axiomatic notions into constructive domains via a partial formalization of the structural axiomatic notions. So if one has done this, then one, of course, can ask oneself, what general features should be required of methodological frames so that they are suitable for extensions of Hilbert's constructivist program? Or which procedures can be viewed as generative ones? Elementary inductive definitions of syntactic notions like formula or proof were clearly viewed in that light from the very beginning. Due to Peter Axel's contribution to the 1977 Handbook of Mathematical Logic, we have an extremely general way of generating mathematical object that goes far beyond the arithmetical generation envisioned by Bernays. Axel's way allow, of course, the generation of natural numbers and of elementary syntactic notions, but they also yield constructive ordinates and even the elements and segments of the cumulative hierarchy of sets can be generated according to axillian rules. In sum, N and O are examples then of inductively defined classes that obey not only the principle of proof by induction, but also the principle of definition by recursion. And the latter, because they are deterministic, that is, uh, you have, if you wish, a unique generation tree for every object that is being generated. So in sum, these deterministic ID classes and inductive definition now viewed in this general axelian way are what I call accessible domains. And the associated accessible principles of proof by induction and definition by recursion support isomorphisms between any two such classes. And I should mention that accessible domains 
were given a category theoretic characterization by my student Patrick Walsh. His dissertation is called A Category Theoretic Characterization of Accessible Domains. It was defended in 2019. Um, and characterizes accessible domains as additional algebras of certain angle factors. I think that's really interesting. In any event, the, what is the point of all of it? The methodological point of projections and the resulting structural reduction is to coordinate and bring into harmony two crucial aspects of mathematical experience. The conceptual one involving abstract notions that have many different models, and the constructive one concerning accessible domains that are characterized uniquely up to a canonical isomorphism. The first aspect provides mathematical explanations that rest on conceptual understanding, whereas the second aspect facilitates thinking about mathematical objects and fundamental principles that are grounded in the inductive generation of those objects. Reductive projections are the crucial means for joining those aspects and guaranteeing also the coherence of the abstract concepts. The philosophical significance of consistency proofs is then to be assessed in terms of the objective underpinnings of the frames to which reductions are achieved. It is precisely here that the various accessible domains play a distinctive role and offer through a comparison of their generating operations, a scale for assessing relative consistency proofs. This remains, in my view, an open field for penetrating philosophical investigations, but also concrete mathematical work. The underlying tasks have fundamentally to do with mathematical cognition. Some fruitful directions for exploring human cognitive capacities I wanted to discuss in the last part of my talk. But this may, uh, well, we have to see how things go. In any event, here I wanted to uh, have a break and give you a break and the opportunity to ask question of this broad survey perspective on the conceptual development of reflections on modern mathematics in the context of proof threat investigations. So here we have it, break for discussion. Okay, uh, this first uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Wilfred Sieg uh, for this uh, wonderful the first part of his lecture. And his lecture has two parts, and uh, we have uh, two se uh, discussion sessions. So after this, uh, he will give another the final part around 20 minutes. Okay, uh, uh, so he has given us a very beautiful overview of the intellectual histor history, conceptual significance, and uh, uh, yeah, of logic. Uh, he examined the first two, uh, the, the, this two points based on the foundational investigation for mathematicals beginning in the late 19th century, especially on the work of Herbert and Venus. Uh, okay, now uh, we have the, uh, the first uh, discussion session. Yeah. Uh, all the audience are welcome to uh, propose your uh, questions. And you can open the video to uh, communicate with the speaker, or you can post your question in the chat box. Okay. Uh, could I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, 
Uh, Professor said, I, I can't, I, I can't pronounce your name uh, correctly. Yeah, thanks for your wonderful and informative lectures. I learned a lot from your lecture. Uh, I'm, I don't work in this field. So as an outsider, I ask a simple question. <laughs> what difference between proof theory and recurring theory? It seems to both investigate uh, the procedure, the process of proving and deduction. What difference between these two subjects? This is my first question. Uh, very simple. Uh, the second is this. Uh, Feng Ye got his PhD from Stanford. He is my former clicker at PK University. He once uh, worked uh, worked in the in philistic uh, mathematics and philistic philosophy of mathematics. He published a book about this in Springer. Uh, I want to know what do you think this kind of approach a uh, fallistic approach is successful or not successful? Is provision or not provision? Okay, this is my simple question. Okay. Okay, very simple questions, <laughs> <laughs> fundamental ones, and interesting. But could you please be so kind and Tell me again the second question briefly, because yeah, I yeah, yeah. did not quite I, understand. I, I, I say Feng Ye, Feng Ye uh, works on the fantastic uh, mathematics and the fantastic uh, philosophy of mathematics. He published a book at, uh, about this in Springer. I, I want to know, what do you think? This kind of philistic approach to uh, mathematics and to philosophy of mathematics is successful or long successful? Or okay. is provision or non provision? Yeah. Well, let me first come to the first question. Uh, proof theory, recursion theory, what's the difference? Um, there is a very intimate connection. The formal representation of proofs should be, in some sense, mechanically checkable. That was a normative requirement for all these formal frameworks, starting with Aristotle to the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. To give a proof was to write down an argument that could be mechanically checked. No additional mathematical insights when needed, in order to recognize that this is a proof that was articulated in particular by uh, Leibniz already and by other folks, and is underlying what I presented. So, Gödel, in his first incompleteness paper, made use of this feature by describing mathematical formalisms after arithmetizing the notions as primitive recursive relations and functions, right? So, so there was 
the issue of what other possible means could be used. Is the concept of a formal theory exhausted by requiring that they are supposed to be primitive recursively accessible? That was a fundamental question. And Goethe used the work that was done in, quote, recursion theory, or what is now called computability theory, to articulate what it means for a theory to be a formal one. And he appealed to work in particular by Turing in 1964, when he gave, when he formulated a postscriptum to lectures he had given in Princeton uh, in 1934. So for the articulation of what a formal theory is supposed to be, the notion of computation is crucially needed. And then, of course, uh, in computability theory, those notions, fundamental notions of recursive function, recursive functionals, of machine computations in a variety of different ways, complexity theory, all of this is being investigated in interesting, important ways. But of course, in proof theory, you're investigating formal theories for reflecting parts of mathematical practice, right? And so that is the focus of proof theoretic investigations. What kind of formal theories are needed and used for the formalization of parts of mathematical practice? And then to articulate ways to establish the coherence of those theories, that is, giving consistency proofs. So, there is an overlap between computability theory and proof theory, but they also have clearly different directions of detailed work. And I, you know, I suppose I should also mention, there is not only this characterization of what a formal theory is supposed to be, but also, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, the articulation of a particular computational problem, the decision problem. Is there a finite procedure, a mechanical procedure, that allows you to decide whether a particular statement in the language of first order logic is provable. And that was a remarkably interesting and foundationally uh, important question to ask and to answer. And that's what was done by Church and by Turing using different notions of Computability, computability. Uh, Church used the notion that Gullet introduced general recursive functions, and he knew its equivalence to lambda definability. And Turing, of course, used his machines to give uh, a general notion of computation. So, in that sense, the what kind of fashion are sort of esoteric foundational questions philosophically inspired had really remarkably deep impact on the development of parts of mathematical logic. Okay, so that is a, a long answer to your first question. Uh, is that okay? Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, second question. Um, I think 
it is mathematically interesting to see which parts of mathematics can be done in restricted frameworks. Uh, so find it just mathematics if that is properly described and that is not unproblematic. Uh, can be used as a restricted framework in which one can carry out mathematics or parts thereof. And such really deeply constructive ways of doing mathematics can reveal interesting uh, algorithms, interesting aspects of the mathematical work. So I'm uh, perfect, perfectly happy to, to, to see work in very restricted frameworks. It may reveal interesting mathematical facts. And of course, one can then make philosophic remarks about the very character of this restricted framework. Um, that's what I think Berner has intended, what I try to do with this notion of accessible domains, natural numbers, constructive ordinates, initial segments of the cumulative hierarchy. Uh, that's, a, for me, an interesting object of philosophical methodological investigations. So on the one hand, interesting mathematical stuff and interesting philosophy concerning the well, foundations of the respective mathematical part. Okay. A shorter answer to your second question. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Dirk. Okay, Professor uh, Danny Askner, so you have a question. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Wilfred, for a wonderful account of these developments. Um, I wanted to ask about a general a moral that might be drawn from it. I mean, once I like very much the role that you uh, indicated of Dedekind in the development of the structuralist understanding of mathematics. And clearly Hilbert played an absolutely crucial role with his espousal of the axiomatic method in mathematics. Um, but in a certain sense, would it be right to say that Hilbert also made a mathematically fruitful but philosophically mistaken uh, move in trying to achieve purely syntactic consistency proofs with his notion of finitist, and that ultimately um, what's needed is a much more conceptual approach to the understanding of the uh, basis for structuralist mathematics, as when Dedekind attempted his theorem 66, notoriously unsuccessful. But there is a conceptual element to that which did achieve something. And in the development that you've described, or that you've given an account of, which work develops from Hilbert's program, that in a certain way, what's being done there is the articulation of that kind of understanding, in particular through relative consistency proofs, uh, mm -hmm. rather than uh, anything that uh, is absolute as Hilbert had hoped for, but turned out not to be possible. Thanks, Daniel. Uh I suppose I view Hilbert's program, the finitist program, as a small part of the overall Hilbertian approach to foundations of mathematics. And that's why I think it is so important to see that Hilbert's early work around 1900 in Foundations of Geometry 
in his uh, axiomatization of real numbers of arithmetic, uh, stands in the Dedekindian tradition. Right. So, you know, you have this direct methodologic connection between Dedekind and Dedekind's way of doing structural axiomatics and Hilbert's way of giving an axiomatic framework for geometry or for analysis. Yes, I agree. Is, I, I mean, the axiomatization he, Hilbert gives in 1900 are not formal things. I mean, sometimes people say, oh, this is just what Hilbert then later did in the 1920s. No, it isn't. It is the Dickinian structural mathematics. Right. And so then if, if, if you look at how Hilbert tried to get a handle on the foundational questions in the late teens, as he had given up real investigations for a long time, uh, and started to make use of the formalism of Principia Mathematica for, quite, for two quite different purposes. At the first point, in these lectures from 1917-1918, he really tried to see, here is a part of the system of Principia Mathematica, and in it one can formally develop analysis. Is this really a successful way of reducing analysis to logic? And, you know, so that's what I quoted. At the end of these lectures, I said, blah, blah, blah. But then, in a very beautiful, clear eyed manner, they investigate, analyze, what is it really one does in Principia Mathematica? What is the role of the axiom of reducibility? And can one still understand this as logic? Well? And the answer is no, it can't help. Yeah. And then in a dramatic shift, Hilbert tries to do something absolutely stunningly elementary. He tries to give a constructive consistency on an absolutely primitive basis. Well, that didn't work out either. And so, in, 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 in a way that can be followed reasonably closely by looking at these early lectures, they come to this realization. So we have here this structural axiomatic approach to mathematics. Here, we seem to have a way of articulating that part of mathematics through its formalization. And then instead of looking directly at the structural axiomatic framework, you look at the formalism in which that part of mathematics is reflected. And that's what they tried to do. That was started only in 1922. That perspective, syntactic consistency grows. And, you know, I think Hilbert was so optimistic about it that he thought, oh, this little bit of the Epsilon calculus, Ackermann, you know, all of this can be done very quickly. And then you can do the real job, analyzing mathematical proofs. So, and I think if one, if one views this particular part of Hilbert's concerns with the foundation of mathematics as genuinely a part of his overall reflections, then I think uh, one can only say, well, this particular way doesn't work. So what else can one do? 
and how can one expand matters in a way that preserves some of the general interesting methodological aspects. And I think that's what Bernays tried to do, what other people have been doing. That's why proof theory is still an interesting and important subject. So, I mean, it was a glorious failure in the sense that philosophically it did, could not succeed, but it provided techniques which greatly furthered the whole project of understanding yeah. the nature of mathematics. Yeah, I think that's the... That's the way of looking at the Hilbert program. Yes. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> sure, thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to see you, yes. Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, there is a question from the audience and uh, in this chat box. Uh, it's about Nelson. He asked, uh, uh, what does constructive ordinal say that, oh, Oh, to say, oh, you mentioned that refer to. They are ordinals lower than gamma zero or omega one C key or other things. No, they are just the so-called constructive ordinals that were introduced by Church and Cleany in the 30s. So it's not a particular system of notations. Uh, so you generate them uh, from zero, say, the first uh, or second number constructive number class, and let's so say you have inductive clauses uh, starting with, well, one is a constructive ordinal, a successor of a constructive ordinal is a constructive ordinal, and if you have a recursive enumeration of constructive ordinals, then you can take the uh, Gödel number of the recursive function as a name for a new constructive ordinal. So you have infinitary objects uh, that are constructive ordinals generated according to these two principles. So the one is a constructive ordinal, the success of a constructive ordinal is a constructive ordinal, and if you have a recursive uh, enumeration, then the supremum of those ordinates is also a constructive ordinate. So those were classes of constructive objects that uh, were introduced, as I said, by Kleene and Church in the uh, 30s and investigated uh, in interesting and important ways. So they are not particular kinds of notation systems. OK. So, any more questions? Uh, okay, I have a quick, uh, quick question. That's uh, just uh, um, for the Hebrews, the uh, Felicity's uh, consistent program. Uh, what does exactly uh, the notion finite method mean? So, is this a Hebrew? Uh, uh, has no uh, or precise notion for this. So how about uh, uh, the uh, people after Hilbert, like uh, uh, Bernays or Goder and, uh, and, and the logician after Goder think of this, uh, this notion of finitary method? Uh, so I'm not, not completely sure how to answer the question. Uh, uh, let me point to, to, to one historical fact. Uh, Bernays gave at the beginning, for the beginning of the term, when Hilbert and he uh, gave lectures in Göttingen, uh, an outline of what was supposed to be covered. And for these lectures, in 1921-1922, in which they gave the first really interesting consistency proof for primitive recursive arithmetic. Uh, he was, he, Bernays, in this draft, uh, described the second part as providing constructive consistency proofs. And Hilbert changed it to 
finitest consistency proofs. I'm not completely sure um, why he did what he did, but finite mathematique was a more or less established concept. It had been discussed in a paper by Bernstein that was published in 1919. And finite mathematique, finitist mathematics, was viewed as all-encompassing from uh, Poincaré to Brouwer. Uh, I mean, any, any kind of mathematics that had constructivist leanings was covered under this notion of finite mathematic. Uh, so that's all I can, can say. So <laughs> I think it was intended to be a broad notion that covered all kinds of different approaches to uh, yeah, a more object-oriented constructive approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, uh, there are people raise our hand, but I didn't notice. So, uh, 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 so please, as uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, offer Richard. Yes. Hi. Sorry, I wasn't. Um, I guess. Well, thanks, Pippi, for this incredible talk. Um, one of my questions was uh, hijacked by Dan. <laughs> Of so, course, yes. <laughs> uh, but I still have a more, maybe more local uh, question about this comment uh, about um, a conception of evidence and certainty not being too absolute. Um, I was wondering what Bernays was, was reacting to. So, what was what was the notion of evidence or uncertainty, which I presume in Bernays would be distinguished. Um, at any rate, um, the way you described it in this talk, I think, was that there, there had to be more relativized and one can see in your framework to what. Um, but I, I was wondering if you can say something more about what it was that he's rejecting at that point to what he's referring? Well, I suppose he was referring and reacting uh, to a perspective where finitist was taken to be fixed in some form or shape and only relative to this finitist position, consistency proofs were allowed. That's what he rejected. And so you don't think there's a, any weight to this, the language, language of evidence, certainty? Uh, Yeah, so an issue for me is what are the philosophical, methodological underpinnings of such a finitist position? And you know that has not been unproblematic uh, right. in the further development of matters. Uh, even the extent of finitist mathematics is, has not been clear. Uh, different, quite different perspectives. Uh, and as you know, Bill Tate has defended for good reasons uh, the position that finitist mathematics should be viewed as being properly articulated through primitive recursive arithmetic. Uh, I mean, this is a coherent position, but certainly not historically accurate. I mean, that is, the Tate finitist mathematics cannot be attributed to Hilbert and Bernays. 
That's just historically not right. Um, I mean, first of all, in 1922, they did give consistency proof of primitive regress for arithmetic. So if you then later know good as results, then you know can't be. Um, uh, and similarly, in the first volume of Grundlagen uh, in Mathematik, they consider functions as being finitist functions that are not primitive recursive. Uh, the same thing holds for other folks working in the Hilbert program at that time. I mean, Abraham, when he formulated uh, a system for elementary number theory, he included explicitly the Ackermann function as mm -hmm. part uh, of the investigation. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think the real question is, well, what are the assumptions you are making philosophically to ground a particular constructivist perspective? That seems to me to be the important question to ask. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bhaskar, so you have a question. Yeah, right. Thanks for the very interesting talk. <clears throat> My question is not very well articulated, so apologies. I'll try to make more sense of it now. So you pointed out really interesting connections between mathematical structuralism on the one hand and proof theory. But now if we conceive a proof theory as a branch of mathematics, then we might also you know, wonder whether we can account for proof theory in structuralist terms. And it seems that, for instance, Gödel's method of arithmetization is a first step to that, right? Because instead of using syntactic entities, not the objects of proof theory are numbers, but we can also take certain sets or all kinds of mathematical objects. Mm -hmm. But if I understood you correctly, I think you mentioned in passing that Bernays considered that like as a, you know, like this new as an artifact of, or as a result of, of the method of arithmetization. So yes. I assume that, that, that Hilbert and Bernays would have really rejected the idea of, of viewing uh, proof theory in structuralist terms. Is that correct? Or maybe can you, can you say something about their view of, of proof theory itself and the connection to, to mathematical structuralism? Yeah. Now, that's an interesting question. Uh, and I'm not completely sure. Uh, I mean, first of all, I wouldn't know uh, on how to say anything about Hilbert. I mean, after all, there is nothing uh, except for two brief pieces that were published by, by Hilbert in 1931 that even indirectly take into account uh, Goethe's incompleteness theorems. And as far as Bernays is concerned, uh, I think As far as I can, can see, uh, he took for granted the arithmetization of metamathematics. And so for him, you're dealing with these concrete mathematical objects. Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know precisely how to how to respond to, to, to the question uh, in an informed and decisive way. I'm not sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Edwin. Sure. sure. Thank you for the question. Okay, uh, next question. A waiting menu? Just open your uh, audio. You uh, use your audio, yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, thanks once again to Wuhan University for this opportunity, and thanks uh, to Professor Sid for this great uh, conference. And I 
have uh, two uh, simple questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, when we speak uh, on this subject uh, of projections, is this a one-to-one -one projection, a bionivocal projection? Is the first question. And when the, my second question is, excuse me, uh, are reductive uh, excuse me, are reductive projections also the most recursive and primitive possible? Uh, that's uh, my two questions. That's my two questions. Yeah, so to the first question about projections. So the idea is to use the formalization to give a partial projection of the structural axiomatic theory into a constructive domain, right? So the the domain of such a projection is somewhat indeterminate, right? Okay. So if you think of the structural axiomatic theory, it is not yet precisely described. It is open ended. Uh, the proofs in such a theory are not precisely described. It's open-ended. So, so forgetting about this indeterminate real beginning, uh, let us just look at, at the connection between the articulation of the formal theory and its uh, articulation in the constructive framework. And that can be either had in the way in which Balthasar and, and other folks are thinking of it, maybe arithmetization, so you're just dealing with particular natural numbers and properties and relations between them. Um, or you can consider these syntactic objects as being in the constructive domain in the first place. And that's what I emphasized early on in me that Hilbert and Berners considered those syntactic objects as real sensible mathematical objects. And then uh, it is just a question of dealing with them in an appropriate constructive framework. Uh, okay. So, or, what, what about me? My second question, uh, yes. concerning to to yeah. So, could you please rearticulate okay. that second? Are 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 yeah? Are uh, reductive projections also the most recursive and primitive possible? I don't know if it's out of context, but that's my question. Um, that's again a difficult question. Uh, I mean, it essentially asks, it seems to me, whether the articulations of the structural axiomatic theories in formal terms are the most primitive ones. And uh, and I mean, clearly, the axiom systems, the formal axiom systems I have been discussing in the examples uh, are naturally 
inspired by the structural axiomatic theories. In the case of, of number theory, the Dedekind formulation of what a simply infinite system is, is the basis for the formal articulation in piano arithmetic. I mean, so there's uh, a simple and direct connection. And similarly, if you look at analysis and second order number theory, it's a direct and uh, formulation that is inspired by the um, articulation of the structural axiomatic viewpoint. So in that sense, I think in the examples I discussed, yes, they are direct and in elementary ways related to the structural axiomatic theories. So in that sense, from it. Thank you very much and happy logic day for all. For Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thanks for all questions. Uh, uh, Professor, uh, we are facing, so I think maybe you should uh, uh, go ahead to the second part. And uh, after that, the people have more questions and then can okay, ask after that. Uh, on the second part. All right. Okay. But I mean, I should tell you, whoever wants to leave and has to leave, they are welcome to do so. I mean, I didn't think that my first part, I practiced it as a matter of fact, would take as much time. Uh, as as it did, so uh, let me. I mean, the second part is not exactly um, short either. So, as I said, if you have to go, uh, by all means, let me. So I suppose you see my screen. Uh, And okay, okay, nice, okay, yeah. So the consistency program was first articulated for structural axiomatic theories. Proofs in such theories use only the structural axioms and elementary inferential steps. What those elementary inferential steps were, that was not initially articulated, neither by Dedekind nor by Hilbert. Um, Frege had been acknowledged, but not taken into the metamathematical investigations at all. And as you saw in my first in the first part, the mathematical way of giving informal rigorous arguments was taken to be representable in formal theories. Thus the proofs of mathematical practice were taken to be formalizable. And for me, that reveals the second phase of proof theory that has not been pursued in any systematic way, namely as a theory of mathematical proofs. Proof theory is concerned with formal theories. But, you know, you take for granted for the significance of all this work, that mathematical practice can be articulated in these form frameworks. There are hints of such a theory of proofs in the 19th century, in projective geometry. Hilbert articulated a 24th problem that was discovered only a few years ago as being in the sequence of problems that actually sought, as he put it, a theory of the method of proof in mathematics 
and then raised issues on proof simplicity and proof identity. There is Palmaro's thesis from 1908 that investigated and classified partition proofs of Pythagorean theorem. And the question for me is, could such a theory be developed in a systematic way? And this part, uh, I discussed already, so I haven't go over it. I just want to point out that in this very pivotal talk Hilbert gave called axiomatic thinking, uh, he called emphatically for a theory of the specifically mathematical proof. Uh, so we have seen that also. Let me go over. So in any event, in this articulation of formal development of analysis, Hilbert and Bernas used the calculus of Principia Mathematica. For pragmatic and methodological reasons, they introduced in the winter term of 1921-22, a new logical calculus. If you wish, an axiomatic form of natural induction that was used throughout the 1920s and 1930s. In Grundlage der Mathematik, for example, that's the calculus they are using. And the axioms indicated here uh, are for conjunction and disjunction. So what was the pragmatic reason for introducing it? this new calculus. Hilbert and Berners believed and in practice saw so, that this calculus allowed a more direct formalization of mathematical proofs. And the methodological reason for doing it this way was also quite straightforward for them. They wanted to do for logic what Hilbert had done in foundations of geometry. Namely, there, there were groups of axioms for every fundamental geometric concept, for incidents, between us, what have you. And they wanted to do this here for logic. So you articulate axioms for the logical connectors. And that's what they did. And uh, so you have linear presentation of proofs using these axioms, and for their consistency proofs, as a matter of fact, they represented deductions in this calculus as trees. So for good reasons, for good proof theoretic reasons to carry out transformations, proof theoretic transformations. Gensen, in his dissertation in 1933, when formulating his natural reduction calculus, built on this work. And he asserted that this calculus, that is, his natural reduction calculus, is as close to real reasoning as possible. Thus, the calculus is particularly suited for the formalization of mathematical proofs. That's what he says. And in his 1936 paper, in which he established the consistency of arithmetic, he considered derivations in this natural reduction calculus as, and I quote, images of mathematical proofs. He wrote in that very paper, and I think it's somewhat startling, given the development of proof theory. The objects of proof theory shall be the proofs carried out in mathematics proper. I mean, that's a part of the whole enterprise that has not been pursued, except in, in the following very simple, simple way. You do give arguments that are not really formalized, but give arguments showing that the principles in particular form of frameworks are sufficient to do parts of mathematics. Right? So one may ask for good reasons and with some skepticism, how can this be accomplished? What kind of questions can be addressed by such a theory of proofs? 
And two questions, it seems to me, are at the heart of such a theory. Number one, what is the actual structure of mathematical proofs? And two, how can proofs be constructed efficiently and strategically? But as I said, these questions have not been investigated in a systematic way. However, I think they are becoming central issues in work on computer-based formal verification and automated proofs such. I have been since the mid-1980s interested in the fine structure of mathematical proofs reflected in appropriate logical frames and strategic ways of constructing proofs interactively and automatically and to develop heuristics for the automated discovery of proofs. I have been pursuing such work. It involved formulating and investigating suitable logical calculi, discovering logically grounded strategies, implementing a proof search mechanism built on the logical work. And here I, I have to, to pause and give myself a second for reflection in this presentation. Um, um, I would like to, to skip, jump over parts of my outline. Uh, But, but let me let me let me continue. Uh, so let me begin first with the issue of formulating investigating suitable logical calculi. Uh, so we saw that Hilbert's and Bernays' axiomatic calculus really articulates natural reduction rules as axioms, or as one should say historically more appropriately, that Gensen turned this axiomatic formulation into his rule-based system. And here are the corresponding rules of Gensen's natural reduction calculus for conjunction and construction. Gensen I should emphasize, did not view the interplay of introduction and elimination rules as distinctive for his natural reduction calculus, but rather the making and discharging of assumptions. That reflected for him an important structural element of proofs in mathematical practice. That emphasis reveals, however, a sort of unnatural feature of natural reduction, for example, if you want to prove the implication A or B, one assumes A and tries to establish B. That proof context that the assumption A is supposed to lead in some form or shape to B is not part of the syntactic configuration one uses to start the sequence of inferences. The first step to reflect the proof context of goals and assumptions can be taken by Gensen's formulation of natural deduction. And he himself calls it a sequent formulation of natural deduction. He does this also in this 1936 in which she proves the consistency of arithmetic. This sequence formulation indicates locally at each proof node on which assumptions the proof of the formula depends. It thus also represents the proof context. And let me show you. Here are the articulation of the natural reduction rules in the sequent way. However, this is not the sequent calculus. It only indicates through the gamma the assumptions on which the proof of phi and psi respectively depends. Here you see it. 
if you have proved the destruction, then if you can also prove taking the first disjunct as an assumption, assumptions a particular formula chi, and taking the second assumption and the second disjunct as um, an additional assumption, you can prove chi, then you're allowed to prove chi. Then you have a proof of chi from the assumptions just in gamma. So this sequence formation doesn't do anything but articulate the assumptions on which the proof of a particular formula depends locally. You don't have to go back to the top of the tree to see which assumptions are still open and which have been destructed. You represent that information locally. All the rules are Wow. Young, I have no idea what is what is happening. Yeah, maybe guess that. And uh, anyway, so you, you can move your mouse, right? Just uh, uh, you, you can move around. Right? Oh, now, now it, the noise that was involved is gone, and I can. Um, proceed, I suppose. Um, so a first step to reflect the proof context uh, of goals and assumptions can be taken via this secret formulation. Uh, and I explain that. But uh, so all the rules of natural induction are operating on the right-hand side of the horseshoe. Uh, but in this way, one retains another unnatural feature of natural detection, detours. Uh, and detours are simple formula occurrences where this particular occurrence has been introduced by an introduction rule and is then immediately the major premise of an elimination rule. So in a certain sense, it is a real detour, has no logic or any other part. Um, the second step leads essentially to Ganson's sequence calculus with any elimination rules applied on the left-hand side and introduction rules on the right-hand side. However, the applications of elimination rules are in general not directed towards the goal that's articulated on the right hand side of the sequence. And a redescription of the logical problem is I try to give and leads to a third step. The redescription is this namely, the task is not to obtain by a finite linearly organized sequence of steps a particular formula from particular assumptions, but rather close the gap between assumptions and a goal by exploiting assumptions via sequences of elimination rules that are directed towards goals to the goal and simplifying goals by the inverted production rules. So what wants to have a system in which one can make forward steps in a goal-directed way by elimination rules and backward steps by introduction rules. That's what I have been calling intercalating. That is, the logical problem is now addressed by a species of goal-directed forward and backward chain. And I introduced these natural intercalation calculi between that are located between sequent and natural reduction calculi. 
and they make this shaming possible. Uh, one can formulate those calculi for classical and intuitionist first order logic and prove that they are complete and that the proofs that are found are essentially normal natural reduction proofs. And one can formulate appropriate, logically well-founded strategies, and they have been implemented in a proof search algorithm, which I call APROS. APROS standing for Automated Proof Search. So we have calculi that support a bidirectional and goal-directed proof construction in both intuitionist and classical first-order logic. And in the same way as ordinary natural reduction trees, such NSNIC proofs are not easily displayed on a computer screen. So we chose a graphical display that is inspired by the representation of natural reduction proofs by Fitch diagrams. And let me show you one example on how such a representation goes. Here is a proof of tertium mandato with uh, a set theoretic atomic formula, X is an element of A. And that's the kind of, of, of representation. So um, I suppose most of you will be familiar with this, so I'm not going to, to discuss this in, in detail. Um, so that one can do for pure logic. One has a calculus that allows forward and backward argumentation. Uh, and the state of the proof construction is indicated by partial proofs. There are gaps in the proof, and the gaps can be filled. It can be filled strategically and in a sensible way. So what about formalization of mathematical proofs. That is ex obtained by extending this purely rule-based strategic approach to include also defined notions and operations. So as soon as you have introduced defined concepts or operations, one has appropriate introduction and elimination rules for those defined notions in a similar way as for the logical basic notions. And in addition, one applies lemmas as rules. I mean, that's an odd technique, right? You have particular lemmas that express interesting mathematical facts on their own, but they essentially are being used in a, more, in a proof of a more um, substantial and fundamental theorem. If you look at the Pythagorean, the proof of the Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem in Euclid's elements, it's exactly structured in that way. It's a short proof appealing to central earlier lands. But that, of course, requires that the subject is carefully conceptually organized. Patrick Walsh and I formalized this natural way, in this natural way, the Kantrabanschner theorem in, in ZF. Mm. Our final proof is built on roughly 100 lambdas. Euclid, for the proof of the Pythagorean theorem, builds on 46 lambdas. So, you know, uh, we need 100 lambdas. And the lambdas actually refer to, in the formal proof of the theorem, articulate direct facts for the concepts of set and function, except for the fundamental error. And here is the proof. It's short and sweet. Eight lines. If you take into account that there are two premises, the proof is of length six. And so there are theorems, lemmas appeal to, and if you have any understanding of the set theoretic stuff, you see, why does one want to prove those? I mean, that's trivial. It's obvious. It's evident. Right? Just the understanding of the notions. 
There is one fundamental level that is actually equivalent to the Kantian Einstein theorem. It expressed sort of sandwich theorem. If you have three sets A, B, and C, such that A is a subset of B and B a subset of C, and you have a bijection from the last to the first set, so there is a bijection between A and C, then the fundamental lemma says, then there is also a bijection between C and B. You might think this is, yeah, straight, straightforward, intuitive, but that's the real core of the problem for this, for this, for the proof of the theorem. That was instead given by Dedeker, 1887. But you know, I'm not going to, to go into details on this either, uh, but um, try to uh, go on. So, so let me make an extremely brief remark about the automated search for the incompleteness theorems for ZF and related results, like Loeb's theorem. So here one takes for granted, axiomatically, if you wish, as lemmas, representability and derivability conditions, as well as particular self referential sentences. I mean, uh, and if one does this, then my proof system A plus proves those theorems. That is, the first incompleteness theorem, the second incompleteness theorem, Loeb's theorem, and other stuff. And let me just indicate um, the here's the proof that is found by by Aprils, uh, of the first half of the first incompleteness theorem, the unprovability of the good sentence. And again, I'll skip the discussion of this uh, just to show you that the strategic articulation of the search, plus a special heuristic in, for this particular uh, part of, of elementary proof theory, the good incompleteness theorems, allow you to formulate a search mechanism that does real work. That is, this is an almost canonical proof of the first half of the first incompleteness there. All of this work has been done in a human-centered way. As you may be surprised to hear this, the ultimate motivation for this work was education. I wanted to show students how to get better at giving proofs in a strategic way, not just the formal manipulation of symbolic expressions. And I hoped that this would carry over, be transferable to ordinary argumentation. So I actually developed two web-based courses, LNP and U and I. I won't talk about U and I, just LNP, logic and proofs. The first course is an introduction to logic, and for its design, we followed all the recommendations of learning science as to conceptual scaffolding, multimodal presentation, and an enormous number of, as they are called in the jargon, ILEs interactive learning environments so that you can play around in the web-based course. But there is one part that is what I consider to be a real enhancement of logic education, namely a sophisticated proof tutor. What does it do, this proof tutor? If a student gets stuck in trying to construct an argument, and he or she really doesn't know 
how to proceed. The student can appeal to the proof tutor. The proof tutor gives the partial proof the student has constructed to the automated theorem prover APRIS. APRIS completes the student proof, possibly with backtracking, and based on this dynamically generated proof, the tutor can give advice to the student. So in that sense, there is genuine artificial intelligence to proof search mechanism for allowing students individually to learn how to construct proofs in a supportive way. Okay, so let me return then after this brief discussion of uh, what kind of calculi one could use for the appropriate articulation of logical proofs, how to extend this in a natural way to the formalization of mathematical proofs and use that to try to search automatically for proofs. So let me return then to Hilbert's 1917 call for a theory of the specifically mathematical proof. I think we have taken steps towards such a theory by introducing the calculator that make it possible to reflect important structures of mathematical proofs. I described some of the mathematical results and discussed in the briefest possible way their use for natural formalization and automated search. Such work allows us to illuminate the second phase of proof theory and to bring it to life by the analysis of mathematical proofs, their formal representation in suitable formalisms, and the expansion of heuristics to find intelligible proofs fully automatically. And here is my claim, my hope. In this way, I hope, we will uncover capacities of the mathematical mind, and more broadly, of the human mind. After all, mathematics is common sense made rigorous. And here are references uh, to papers in which you find a fuller list of references. And here's the URL for the course logic and proofs. If you wanted to see how this is done, how this educational goal has been pursued, and at the moment, uh, I think logic and proofs is as polished as it gets without additional remarkable input. Uh, you can click on this and you can play around. In any event, uh, thank you so much for listening even to the second part. Okay, um, let's thank uh, Professor Wilfrey for this uh, very interesting and wonderful and also long lecture. Okay, maybe you will be the title now. Uh, anyway, uh, is there any question or comment for this second part? Uh, we have a lot of questions for the first part. Maybe just uh, one quick question, okay? Well, try it. Uh, and if you uh, want to look at matters in a slightly different way, I can provide you with a URL from which you can download uh, what we call the proof lab, in which you can not only be guided uh, in the context of a particular structured course, but you can articulate your own problems and try to, to prove them in the context of the proof lab. That can be done in logic, in set theory, elementary parts of set theory, of course, and uh, for the building completeness theorems and related matters. 
Okay, uh, if no question, I just asked a uh, uh, very quick question, okay. Uh, so you use apples and the continent, we know that we have many pro-assistant like lean and antidote. So do you think that in which aspect uh, uh, the, uh, the apples you use is more efficient than other pro-assistants? I don't know about efficiency. I mean, um, the direction and the purpose of APROS is completely different. The whole enterprise is different. It is human-centered, it is not machine-oriented. If you look at the output of proofs, say, in Koch or Isabel, they are not readable. We wanted to have a proof search algorithm that supports humanly intelligible proof search. That's what it's all about. So it's a different way of doing proof search and verification of proofs in a way that is human centered. Um. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question uh, from Michele uh, Finini. Uh, he asked, uh, how well does this work for weaker logics, where principles such as uh, the natural deduction theorem, the law of excluded middle or contraposition are not accepted? I know. One can... Um, let me see. I stop share. Yes, okay. Yeah, so... The articulation of integration calculus is such that, of course, you can restrict the rules uh, in such a way that you have intuitionist logic, that you have minimal logic. And I have not pursued this, but a colleague of mine at, uh, at the Ohio State University in Columbus, uh, Neil Tannen, has done similar things uh, for uh, relevant logics, uh, what he calls core logic, uh, in interesting ways. So I can, of course, pursue this kind of automated proof search for weaker logics. 